Hi there. Lead time is a variable which is fundamental to understanding how much inventory you need to fulfill demand. However, it's often a factor which is overlooked by many companies, with many instead focusing on inventory forecasting. Today on Locad TV, we're going to understand exactly why lead times are so important to business success, and also discuss why, if you don't take them seriously, you might as well use a random number generator when it comes to forecasting. So Janice, I think this is probably one of the more simplistic topics we've kind of talked about on Locad TV. Um, so why is it something we're talking about today? So, yeah, I would say lead times is uh, maybe not the elephant in the room, but something slightly smaller than an elephant. Let's say the horse in the room that gets, uh, that gets ignored. Um, the elephant in the room that is ignored is just the probabilistic nature of the demand forecast itself. So there is uncertainty on demand and you have to deal with it. But uh, the horse in the room just next to the elephant is the fact that the lead times also has some, uh, some uncertainty and also need to be properly forecast. So why is that? Well, lead times, it's much more, I would say, technical. It's not very complicated, but you need to be I would say uh, to, to be aware of the fine print of your supply process. So you need to know exactly what is happening production side. You need to know what is happening in terms of transportation of transport. Um, if you have several transportation options available, such as transporting your goods, you know, by sea or by air, uh, you need to be aware of that, and that has a factor uh, that has an impact on the lead times. So it's, uh, it's a lot of small details and you need to pay attention to the small details so that, it's, uh, so, so, so that you get, I would say, um, a correct modelization or correct understanding of, of the situation. And um, maybe also it's not as glamorous as, as focusing on future demand, but the reality is that because uh, the lead times have pretty much kind of a, a linear effect on all the, um, the inventories that you need to manage. Roughly speaking, if you have lead times that are twice as long, you need um, stocks that are twice as large. Um, it is frequently an, a, a, an element that is, I would say, underestimated. Um, again, because it's, uh, it's more technical, I guess. Okay, and it, so you sort of mentioned there about the complexity of the approach. Um, what sort of the first step someone should take if they wanted to improve the way they were approaching their lead times? I mean, first is measurement. I mean, very frequently there is relatively poor measurements of the lead time. Uh, again, it's not, I would say, mission critical to measure the lead time to just operate the supply chain. Sometimes you can, you, you know, just just let things take as, as much time as they, as they do, and this is it. Uh, but if you want to optimize, you need to have um, good measurements. And ideally, you want to measure things uh, for every single step. You can't be like, I would say, insanely granular, granular or in theory, you could go into insane granularity of measuring, you know, um, at e every, every minute uh, over several weeks of time where was the exact position of a product so that you're going to have like complete visibility on exactly where does product get stuck because the reality is that you know when you have like 13 weeks of lead times to get something from Asia is that most of the time products are not moving. Um, but uh, without getting to this, I would say, extreme perspective, you, if you can already, I would say, clearly differentiate the, the, the manufacturing lead time, the, the time it takes to transport uh, uh, port to port, the time it takes to transport from port to warehouse, the time it takes once things have been received, uh, I would say, in your warehouse, how much time does it take to have things on the shelves ready to be picked and further serve to clients extra. Um, to, 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 to have all those measurements done properly, and usually we are not talking of, of millions of measurements, it's like half a dozen, that gives you, I would say, a great entry point to do your lead time forecast and your lead time optimization. Because the first thing that you will realize is that maybe some delays are completely accidental and that out of your 13 weeks of lead times to import from Asia, 
you have, let's say, two weeks that are just um, the delay, it takes you to reach a decision to know how much to reorder. So that's completely accidental and could be automated away so that those two weeks becomes like uh, nothing. It's, um, same day decisions. So let's talk about that variability then. So what are the key factors that are kind of contributing to this sort of variability in lead times? Um, so transportation have itself a bit of viability. I mean, for example, depending on weather conditions, um, a, a cargo that you that is coming from Asia might take a couple of days, uh, you know, um, that are uh, um, uh, more or less. So it's not it, it, it's not exactly, I would say, um, super precise. Then um, if you have to go through the customs uh, in a port, the customs themselves can add, you know, an extra week of delay randomly. Then um, you have, before transporting the goods, you have to produce them and um, your supplier might have received other orders from other clients and you have no control over that. So that the workload, I mean, uh, how busy is your supplier at this precise point of time is something that is a bit out of, outside your control. So even if in theory, Producing 1,000 units with uh, a, a production unit takes exactly one week. If this production unit is already busy serving another client, it might take uh, 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 it might take longer. So, so the the, the production uh, lead time is itself varying because there is other your suppliers are not actually 100% dedicated to you, etc. etc. So there is many causes that can create I would say random fluctuations in the lead times. Okay, so what you're sort of saying there is instead of taking a whole lead time as one whole thing, we should be splitting it into all its sort of distinct little parts. I mean, does this not add a lot of extra complexity? It does add complexity, but it's also the only way to have, um, I would say, a reasonable measurement of your lead time. Um, you, if you want to understand what are your lead times, you need to decompose them into their fundamental pieces. Yes, you end up having maybe half a dozen of, I would say, time segments, you know, um, um, the delays to produce, the delays to transport through maybe from uh, um, through cargo to the port, the, the delay to transport by truck from port to your warehouse, um, the delay to ship from your warehouse to the final client, the delay um, for you to take a decision on how much you need to reorder and maybe the delay that you have in between two reorders, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So, so yes, you have to decompose, but the reality is that if you want to have like a reasonable uh, measurements of your lead times, um, there is no really, uh, um, there is, there is no real alternative. It's, it's not because you decide to ignore the problem that the problem goes away. Okay, but it sounds like with each of these individual factors, there's going to be a lot of uncertainty. With every single one of them, there's a real range of uh, pro probabilities that could possibly happen. So how can you have any confidence in your, uh, what you're predicting a lead time to be? Um, so that's, that's uh, where you typically need like an algebra of distributions where you can combine your variables and, uh, and your probabilistic variables. I mean, look at as one, but um, other, other options uh, that, that exist. Uh, but, but bottom line is that, yes, you will have probabilistic measurements, but uh, for every step of, of the process that represents certain viable amount of days, and you will need to combine them, which is just making an addition you know, like this delay plus this delay plus this delay, except that you have probabilistic variables that you're, that you're adding. Um, and you have to understand that the, um, the, the, the noise, the statistical noise, do not really compound. So uh, yes, you have, um, you have um, more uncertainty f um, as, as you are adding variables in terms of total spread of uh, uh, of, of, of possibilities, but it doesn't mean that um, the lead time uncertainty skyrocket just because you're adding steps. You know, just what, we're, what you're doing in the end is just to, to decompose a large delay in small pieces that you can estimate more accurately just because they represent distinct um, processes. 
Okay, and if we bring sort of things together a little bit now to sort of wrap things up, um, let's have a real world example. Have you sort of got an example of a time when a customer of yours has improved the way they're approaching their lead times? And how did that kind of affect their business processes? I mean, yes, I mean, as you start measuring your lead times, um, the most classical finding is that you just realize that you have um, delays that are completely accidental. I mean, when I say completely accidental, you just realize that goods arrive in a location, stay there for five days with nothing happening, just to be moved again. And those five days can be shrinked to nothing. If you just decide, okay, instead of putting there on shelves, wait for five days without doing anything and then keep them moving, it just keeps them moving all the time. So, um, and then again, better forecasts will help you to reduce the amount of stock that you need to keep over the place, but shorter lead times are uh, doing that in a way that is much more efficient. Again, just think that if you could bring all your lead times to zero, you would not need any inventory whatsoever. You know, if you, if you could just say whenever you have one unit that is being requested by a client, I would say instantaneously you could produce ha uh, this unit and have this unit transported to the client, uh, that would be like just in time everything and you would not need, you know, any stock, any planning, anything. Um, so compressing the lead times have, uh, I would say, um, positive effects through the entire supply chain. Uh, also, I mean, it's not just that it's reduce the stock is that if you have shorter lead times, you do not need to plan uh, uh, as far ahead as you used to do. You know, if, if, you, if you can compress your 12 weeks lead times into an eight weeks lead times, it means that you only need to forecast the demand eight weeks ahead instead of 12 weeks ahead. And the reality about the forecast is that the further in the future, the more inaccurate the forecasts are. So, so if, if you can forecast you know, only the, the short term and not the long term, your forecasts by design are more accurate, um, which simplifies again everything and makes your, all, uh, your overall supply chain more efficient just because um, uh, you do not have to look that far into the future. Um, so you mentioned there sort of unexpected delays. I mean, that's probably quite surprising to a lot of our viewers. I mean, surely a business should have a good understanding of every step of their process. So how can these unexpected delays actually occur? Um, sometimes uh, the, the devil is in the details. Um, just to give you an example of a uh, warehouse that I, I visited um, a few years back. Um, the thing was they were receiving um, electronic orders for goods to be delivered, to be shipped. And uh, the system was actually, they had inside the warehouse a system that was actually printing the uh, electronic orders that were received. So the idea is that they were print a request and uh, an employee would come, take the, the request that was printed on paper and go do the picking and, and ship it. Uh, expensive goods, so it was fairly um, reasonable to have like a relatively manual process for picking inside the warehouse. Um, but the thing was that uh, the way the printer was set up was the, 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 uh, the shipment orders that were received would be printed and then the sheet of paper would fall in the box and, and then it would build up a stack of orders. But the thing is that it was um, the last order that they had received and printed would come on top. So when the employee would come to the box to take a sheet of paper so that it would have um, the request printed to, to know what to pick and what to, to expedite, um, this employee would actually always take the last order being received electronically. And so if you had a stack, the, the, the order that was at the bottom of the stack would stay there until the entire stack had been cleared. And, what, and so, if it was like a busy period, you could receive an order and there, there were other orders that would pile up and the thing that was at the bottom of the stack would just stay at the bottom of the stack for a completely indefinite amount of time, uh, potentially days. And you had to reach a point where the stack had been entirely cleared 
to expedite the last item. So what was happening was that they had, uh, instead of having like uh, first come, first served, which is like, you know, first in, first out, FIFO, they had LIFO actually implemented, which is last in, first uh, out. And the trick was they had LIFO uh, on the printer side, just because, you know, um, all orders being printed and you have a stack, but uh, hundreds meters, uh, I would say, downward in the stream, they had the same problem happening all over again because of a conveyor belt that was too short. So, th so the, they were picking stuff and putting the, the boxes on a conveyor belt. Uh, the conveyor belt was manual, so you just, just push, and it was just uh, something like 10 meters long, and it was too short. So what was happening, the conveyor belt would get full of boxes, and then the employee could not put the box on the conveyor belt. So what would the employee do? He would put it on the ground just in front of the conveyor belt. And then he would go back, pick another box, and come back to the conveyor belt to find that the conveyor belt had not moved and it was still full. So what we would do, he would put the other box on the ground again, and things would pile up. So the employee w was ending up having a pyramid of boxes being built you know, uh, in front of the conveyor belt. And again, once as soon as the conveyor belt started moving again, people would take the boxes that were sitting in front of the conveyor belt back into the conveyor belt. But guess what? They, they would actually start again from the top of the pyramid. Uh, and, and so you had to kind of unstack the entire pyramid that was sitting in, uh, in front of the conveyor belt to have the, the box that was the oldest one brought back to the conveyor belt. So they had lethal once, uh, w once again. So you see, you, um, the, the devil is in the details. Sometimes the small implementation details can uh, generate, I would say, random lead time fluctuations just because uh, there is like a, 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 a physical setup that is, that is slightly, ever so slightly imperfect. Okay, so I guess top tip for today, buy a longer conveyor belt and put a hole in the bottom of your box. Yeah, I guess so. So that's everything for this week. Uh, we'll be back again next week with another episode. But until then, thanks for watching.